good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so very much uh, for coming along. Um, what I thought would be uh, useful at the beginning is to have a few ego slides, talk a bit about myself, uh, what my background is, and therefore what sort of angle, what sort of perspective I'm coming at with this new book, with Being Human. And I'm a professor at the University of Westminster, just down the road, I cycled over. And the topic of my research, what my science is all about, is in a relatively recent field of science called astrobiology. It's all about looking into the possibility of there being life beyond the Earth. So I've come from a biology background, and astrobiology is all about extending that understanding and knowledge of how life on Earth got started, what kind of conditions it can survive under, and extending that to other places in our solar system and beyond in the galaxy. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about our next door neighbor planet, Mars, and whether Mars ever had the appropriate sort of environment for hardy microbial, so bacterial-like life forms to get started. And if they're there, if there are Martian bugs, what would be the best way of trying to find them? What sort of biosignatures or signs of life would we want to go look for? What sort of experiment or instrument do we want to strap to the front of our Mars rover to try to find if there are Martian bugs there? And alongside that research, I'm working in the lab with my PhD students, I do a lot of this sort of stuff, telling people about the science that gets me all excited, I'm, I'm really passionate about, and writing books. Uh, so my first major book, which I did give a Google talk uh, on a few years ago, uh, was called The Knowledge, How to Rebuild a World from Scratch. And this was a thought experiment. So let's say, just for sake of argument, there's been some kind of global catastrophe, a, a doomsday event, an apocalypse, and the vast majority of the human race has died and civilization, as we know, it, has collapsed. But for whatever reason, this lovely room in the Google headquarters has served as some kind of hardened bunker. And we have survived the end of the world when everything else has been destroyed. We're a post-apocalyptic survival community. And we're going outside an hour's time, blinking in the bright afternoon sunshine, see the smoking ruins of London, the rest of the civilization around us, and asking yourselves, well, what next? What would you most need to know how to make, how to do, to support yourselves when everything we take for granted in our modern lives has just disappeared? And could you go about rebooting civilization itself, in the way you reboot a computer after it's crashed? Could you accelerate that process of recovery? Could you leapfrog and find shortcuts through this network of science and technology that built the modern world that we all live in? So effectively what I'm doing with this book is, could you do this for real? Could you do Minecraft for real? Could you start in a blank, empty landscape and know what are the useful natural resources to go and seek, to dig up, how to get metal out of rocks, how to use things in different combinations with each other, to make useful tools and technologies and pull yourself back up by your own bootstraps. Um, so effectively what I'm doing with the knowledge is looking at the history of human ingenuity, and resourcefulness and inventiveness and seeing how the world that we take for granted was created through those. And what I've done with my uh, most recent book, with the previous book, Origins, is now pull up on that perspective even further and look at not how human ingenuity built the world, the modern world, but how features of the planet itself we live on have had a huge defining influence on the course of human history. So aspects of plate tectonics and continental drift or the circulation of the atmosphere high above our heads or where different natural resources can be found and metals and how that's had an influence on all the different societies and cultures and civilizations through history. And with the latest book, the one I'm here to talk to you about um, this afternoon, Being Human, I'm now continuing that same kind of investigative process, trying to sort of break apart what we're familiar with in our world, hold up a mirror to it, make commonplace everyday things seem strange. So I'll talk about uh, human family um, in the course of this talk and show you why actually the family feels really familiar, it feels really commonplace, but actually it's quite a strange thing when you think about it. And look at what the consequences of that human family unit have been through history, what were the biological origins of it. So I'm sort of dissecting us as a species as you like, if you like, in this book. What is innate or intrinsic about humanity as an animal, uh, of our different aspects of our genetics or our anatomy or our psychology 
and cognitive biases and see how those have had an effect through history. So we'll start um, with family, one of the first chapters of the book. And what's been happening over our evolutionary lineage from when we separated, we diverged from the chimpanzee, the most recent common ancestor of chimpanzees around seven million years ago, uh, through hominin type ancestors like Australopithecus about three million years ago, and then up to our uh, anatomically modern humans around 300,000, maybe 200,000 years ago, there have been two major trends in our evolution. We developed to be able to walk upright, and we became more and more intelligent, giving us the capabilities for tool use, problem solving, language, cooperation. So we developed to be both bipedal and big-brained at the same time. And those two evolutionary adaptations are effectively at loggerheads with each other. That they're sort of mutually exclusive in that sense. Because if you look down here, this is uh, the hole that we have and other mammals have in their pelvis that allows the baby to pass through the birth canal during birth. And the design constraints you need for adapting a pelvis to be able to walk upright constrict the hole, whereas you need to expand the hole to fit bigger and bigger brains, bigger and bigger skulled babies through. So that fundamental disconnect with our evolution. And the solution that evolution hit upon was to extend the developmental process of humans long after they passed through that hoop of birth. We have many, many years after being a child and then being an infant when we're effectively entirely dependent on our parents to support ourselves, to carry us around, to, to feed us, to protect us, compared to something like an antelope, which within just a matter of minutes can spring up and walk alongside its mother. And so that places an enormous drain on the resources, on the care that a, the mother alone is able to provide. So in our human evolution, we developed biparental investment, not just the mother helping raise the child, but the father became absolutely uh, crucial in that process as well. But through that process of biparental investment, you need to effectively have a uh, mutual exclusivity contract. You need to have a biological contract so that the mother during pregnancy and then the early years of child rearing can be certain that the father, the man, is going to stick around and help with the assistance. On the other hand, the father needs to be assured that the woman is committed to the relationship as well and he in fact is the father of that child and not someone else. And the solution that ever evolution hit upon for that biological contract is pair bonding. There is a hormonal bond that links mother and father that is mediated through the hormone oxytocin. And other pair bonded species such as birds also use oxytocin for that same biological bonding between mother and father. Now oxytocin plays several roles in uh, mammalian behaviour. It triggers the contraction of the uterus muscles for the process of childbirth. It triggers uh, milk secretion for lactation um, and also forms that strong bond between the mother and her baby. And in humans, we simply extended that oxytocin bond to cover the mother and the father as well. And there's another brain chemical that's also involved in that process, which is dopamine, the sort of pleasure compound of the brain, which is also stimulated by psychoactive drugs uh, like caffeine, nicotine, uh, opiates. So you could say quite fairly that love is an addictive drug. It has a very, very similar neurochemistry behind it. And we experience that oxytocin pair bond as romantic love. That's, that's a human adaptation for binding mother and father together. And marriage is no more than a cultural construct built upon that biological foundation of pair bonding, and the pair bonding between mother and father and between both parents, the child, is the basis of the human family. That sort of human family unit is an oddity within mammals. It's one of our adaptations uh, supporting our big brains and our intelligence. Now, with the emergence of civilization, 
with agriculture and the ability to accumulate resources. So accumulate the grain that you've harvested or the livestock that you're keeping. We came to not just inherit uh, physical traits from our parents, so the colour of our eyes, but also uh, things like wealth, resources, uh, territory, and the influence and status that those afford you. So inheritable power gave rise to monarchies and ruling dynasties and, ex and the succession of that absolute power, that sovereign power from one individual to the next within the same uh, family gives us that deep link between kinship, between relationships and kingship, between sovereign power. So although uh, reproduction, pair bonding, family, all fundamental biological aspects of us as a species, and on top of that we have social constructs like marriage and the inheritance of power built on, built on top of them, within those ruling dynasties in history, um, those biological functions took on a whole new level of significance. Marriage became not just the union between two individuals, the purpose of, of, of child rearing. It came to represent the tying together of two powerful families. And strategic marriages became used as a political tool to secure peace between kingdoms or to cement alliances. And the children born of that union intertwined the bloodline of both of those uh, dynasties, and the child could then come to inherit both crowns, come to rule both kingdoms. So the human imperatives of pair bonding and reproduction became tools of, of statecraft, a sort of a much higher level uh, within society. Now we can think of many different um, notable royal families from history of the uh, Bourbons in France, the Tudors in England, in English history, the Ming Dynasty, the Tokugawas in Japan. But by far the most influential uh, ruling family, the most influential dynasty in European history were the Habsburgs. And the Habsburgs started from relatively humble beginnings in the Duchy of Swabia up here in what is uh, northern Switzerland today. And they're able to manoeuvre themselves to become the uh, de facto inheritable crown of the Holy Roman Empire. So they effectively sort of absorbed bits of Germany and Central uh, Europe. And then through a system of, uh, a mastermind system of strategic political alliances, marrying into other royal families across Europe, uh, being masterminded by the Habsburg King Maximilian I, um, he had his uh, own marriage was arranged to the heiress, the Duchy of Burgundy. So they acquired bits of France and the Low Countries up here. Um, and he arranged for his son to marry the heiress of both Castile and Aragon. And so their son then inherited the crowns of a unified Spain. Uh, Maximilian also arranged for his grandson to marry Isabella of Portugal. And so within just 50 years, within just two generations of this carefully plotted out system of uh, dynastic marriages, they're able to uh, extend their dominion over effectively half of Europe. And this was all uh, almost completely bloodlessly. This through strategic marriage rather than invasion and, and, and war. Although they had to protect their claims sometimes with, with armies. So they really were, the Habsburgs really were the grandmasters of the Game of Thrones. And all of this period of history coincided uh, from the European perspective of the age of exploration and discovery and colonization and, and exploitation. So the map we see on the bottom here is all of the territories around the world that the Habsburgs came to rule over, although not necessarily all at the same point. So this includes the Spanish and Portuguese territories uh, in the Americas, around the African coastline, parts of uh, India, the Spice Islands. The Philippines were claimed by the explorer Magellan named after Philip II. Um, that's where they got, that got their names from. And you'll see on this map, even England for a short period was within this Habsburg dominion when Philip II of Spain married uh, Queen Mary I in 1554. So this one family, single family, was able to spread its arms to encircle the entire world. 
And in the early 16th century, the Habsburg King Charles V became the first ruler in human history to reign over an empire upon which the sun never set. Long, long before the British Empire, it was the Habsburg Empire that encircled the world. Um, but this single dominion of the Habsburg Empire was split um, after Charles V with the, uh, between his brother and his son to create the Spanish Habsburg dynasty and the central European branch uh, of that family. And it's within that Spanish Habsburg dynasty that this programme of strategic royal marriages uh, had a particularly acute biological blowback. And the problem here is that with consanguineous marriages, marriages between related uh, families, related royal families, you not only reinforce political power, but you also, uh, and this inbreeding over the generations, uh, creates a reduction in genetic variability, genetic diversity, um, one generation going to the other. It consolidates political power, but also defective genes. And so the very means of their ascendancy um, also held the seeds for the catastrophic collapse of this hugely powerful ruling dynasty of the Spanish Habsburgs. And out of the 11 marriages in the line of kings leading up to Charles II, nine of them were consanguineous, were between closely related family members, between first cousins or between the <laughs> even more unpalatable from, from our point of view in the sort of modern world, between uh, uncle and niece. Um, and so the degree of inbreeding uh, between increased tenfold over the two centuries leading up to Charles II. Now, the most conspicuous aspect of that consanguineous marriage, those inbreeding within the Spanish Habsburgs, was in their face. They developed a, a long, uh, humped nose with an overhanging tip, uh, a droopy, bulbous lower lip. So one of the Habsburg kings, uh, Leopold I, uh, in the second half of the 17th century, was pretty unkindly nicknamed uh, Fotzenpoidel uh, in Vienna, which you could translate as, as twat face or vagina face. He was, he was remarked upon by his sort of bulbous uh, lower lip. Um, but even more noticeably in the Habsburg family was their sharply jutting out uh, lower jaw to such an extent that the top and lower rows of teeth no longer even met each other. Chewing became very difficult. Uh, and this is the so-called Habsburg jaw. So going from Maximilian I on the left here, who was the architect, the mastermind, of that carefully plotted system of, of dynastic marriages, going to his great, 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 great grandson, Charles um, II, we see that uh, increasingly pronounced Habsburg jaw, which can be demonstrated to be, to be due to that increasing levels of inbreeding down the generations. But there are even more severe consequences for the Habsburgs of that inbreeding. Um, and the dynasty suffered uh, increasingly from epilepsy uh, and other mental health issues, as well as strings of miscarriages and stillbirths. And so this royal family, one of the most pampered and privileged families in the world, with access to the best nutrition, the best health care at the time, suffered an overall infant mortality rate of about 80%, which is four times higher than a Spanish peasant family living at the same, uh, living at the same time. And the, all of this came to a head with Charles II, who became known as El Echizado, the, the hexed uh, or the cursed. Uh, due to his many, many different severe afflictions, which weren't due to just one, one particular mutation, one genetic disorder, but an entire suite of genetic disorders that all been concentrated um, in this last king of the Spanish Habs Habsburgs. And he was never fit to rule as king. Uh, so first his mother and then his second wife ruled in his stead uh, as regent, ruled on his behalf. And the only thing that this dynasty, the only thing the kingdom needed of him was that most fundamental of human functions, which is, was just, just re reproduce, just produce an heir so at least we can continue into the next generation. 
Uh, but despite two marriages, uh, he never fathered any children. It seems quite clear that he was congenitally incapable of, of fathering uh, a child. So after generations of inbreeding and that mounting genetic burden, uh, the entire dynasty effectively collapsed. They strategically married themselves into extinction. And the crisis that precipitated uh, in 1700 with the death of Charles II triggered the war of uh, Spanish succession. There was a scramble between the other European powers to try to claim as much of their territory as it crumbled and fell apart uh, with the collapse of the empire um, and saw a sort of great shift in the political landscape um, across Europe after that war of Spanish succession. And I wanted to move on uh, to another story in the book. So I basically cherry-picked uh, what I felt were the most interesting and fascinating and profound examples of these deep links from fundamental aspects of us as a species, of our biology and the historical consequences of them. And one of my other favourite examples when I was researching and writing the book is this one about uh, changing our minds. How as an intelligent, self-aware, conscious species, we go out of our ways to try to alter our state of mind. We, we exploit plants and then fungi to affect the very functioning of our brain, to stimulate uh, or intoxicate, to calm, to invigorate, to alter our perception of the world. And indeed, enjoying that process of getting out of our minds, of changing how we perceive the world, is pretty much universal of human cultures um, around the planet. And through widespread production, as well as international trade, uh, there are four substances that came to be consumed widely around the world uh, in order to change our minds, and in doing so, came to change uh, the course of world history, came to change the world as well. And these are uh, alcohol, nicotine with tobacco, caffeine through tea and coffee, and then morphine or other opiates harvested uh, from opium. And these are all psychoactive substances. Your cup of coffee in the morning is psychoactive. It is modifying and altering how your brain functions, which is why you look for that sort of buzz with your first cup of coffee in the morning. So all of these psychoactive substances affect our neurons in slightly different ways, but they all trigger the same reward center uh, in the center of, our, center of our brain, which is the mesolimbic pathway. And this core pathway right deep in our brains, runs from the top of the brain stem up to the base of the forebrain. And it's a tract of nerve cells, a tract of neurons that, which release that signaling compound dopamine, which I mentioned earlier. It's, it's known as the, the pleasure compound of the brain. And although that mesolimbic pathway, the neurons in it constitute only a tiny percentage of all the nerve cells in the brain, something like 0.001%, it is enormously important in motivating our behavior towards survival and reproduction. So eating food, uh, quenching your thirst, having sex, those all trigger the mesolimbic pathway. It's, it's like a reward signal. It's lighting up a reward signal in the brain. And we perceive that as the sensation of, of pleasure. So in order to tune our behavior for survival, our brain gets us to repeat actions that triggered that pathway last time and avoid actions which suppressed it in the past. So the pleasure center of the brain, the mesolink pathway, is also therefore deeply linked to the process of how we learn, how we learn what are useful things to be able to do. And therefore it's linked uh, intrinsically to addiction as well. So problems arose uh, when humans discovered ways of lighting up that mesolimbic pathway um, by by doing things other than activities which help our survival and reproduction, other than things we would have been doing in our natural world, um, namely drugs, namely psychoactive drugs. So alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, opiates, they all effectively short circuit, they all effectively hack that mesolimbic system by increasing the levels of dopamine in that pathway. Um, but as a flip side of that, they're also intrinsically addictive. You're not just looking forward to your buzz of your first cup of coffee. You are dependent on that cup of coffee. If you don't have it for a day or two, your mind is foggy and you probably get some kind of throbbing headache. 
that is an addiction, to something relatively um, unserious. Um, but in the 18th century, the British demand for tea uh, came to be supplied by the illicit trafficking of another psychoactive drug. So the story about, I'm about to tell you is how a mind-altering addictive substance was used as a weapon, as a political tool by one empire to subdue another. Uh, so the demand for tea had been uh, growing steadily through the 18th century, with most of it coming from China. But the problem was China just had no interest at all in anything the British Empire could supply. So we were facing, Britain was facing a colossal trade deficit. And pretty much the only thing the Chinese valued was hard cash in, in, in the form of silver. Um, so we were hemorrhaging, the sort of late 1700s, Britain was hemorrhaging this precious metal across the East until the East India Company realized that they could create a growing market for something that they were able to source cheaply and easily in bulk. Because although the Chinese government would only consider silver for official trade, uh, the Chinese people keen on something else, which was opium. So opium is the, uh, the, the latex, the fluid that sort of exudes out of cuts you make in the immature seed pods of the poppy. And it contains morphine as well as codeine, which provides the pain relief uh, from, from opium. But that opium, that, that morphine, also triggers that mesolimbic pathway that we saw earlier. So it gives you a, a buzz of pleasure. It was adopted to be used not only as a medicine, but as a recreational drug. And we started, the East India Company started drug running uh, opium into China, uh, where it was outlawed at the time. So the East India Company couldn't just sail into port and, and unload it. They used uh, middlemen of Indian merchants to sail it into the estuary of the Pearl River, uh, sell it for silver, and then smuggle it ashore to then be distributed across China. Um, so although it was illegal for non-medicinal purposes in China at the time, Opium was legal and, and quite widespread in, bit, uh, in Britain this period in history. Uh, it tended to be dissolved into alcohol uh, to give laudanum, which you've, you've probably heard of. And that was freely available as a painkiller. It was even uh, used in cough medicines for, for babies. And lots of literary figures in this period of history were effectively high-functioning opium addicts, laudanum addicts. So uh, Lord Byron, Charles Dickens, uh, John Keats, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, but they all took their opium fix, their opium hit, um, by drinking it, by drinking the laudanum. So that delivered to the relatively slow release of opiates into the bloodstream. Whereas the Chinese, on the other hand, had taken to smoking opium. It was a habit they probably picked up from the Dutch on the island of Taiwan, where they're trading at the time. And smoking opium gives you a much more rapid, a much more intense hit, and therefore is so much more potent and a lot more addictive. And East India Company realised they could exploit that addictive property. Once you've gained a clientele, they will just keep coming back for more and more. It's the perfect trade item in that sense. And so in this sense, the British addiction for tea was being traded for the Chinese addiction to opium, which was a great deal more destructive to, to Chinese society than, than our drinking a cup of tea in the morning. And the East India Company could effectively grow as much of that new currency as they needed. They had huge plantations for it in India. And so this pipeline pumping opium, forcing it into China, expanded and expanded until in 1806, just after the Battle of Trafalgar, that trade deficit had been forcibly reversed. And for the first time in history, silver now began flowing from China into Britain. And we kept on, the East India Company kept on pushing those opium imports into China. Uh, so the opium imports trebled between 1810 and 1828, and then almost doubled again by 1832. The British were, were wielding this addictive substance uh, as a tool of imperial subjugation. It was being used very deliberately as a, as a, as a tool or weapon in that sense. Uh, so the Chinese emperor in 1839 effectively declared a war on drugs. He declared a war on the import of opium. And 
uh, appointed a high-flying bureaucrat called Lin Zexu to stamp out that opium trade. And he turned up the main uh, European trading port uh, in the province of Canton, demanded that the factories uh, stop uh, distributing the opium and destroy it. And they laughed in his face and said, no, no, we're not going to be doing this. This is an enormous amount of money. Uh, so Lin Xu uh, nailed closed all the doors to the factories, the warehouses where the Europeans uh, were at, cut off their food supply, and it became this sort of hugely heightened, hugely tense situation. And it was the chief superintendent for trade uh, for Britain, a guy called uh, Charles Elliott, who was able to defuse this flashpoint, this situation, by persuading the traders, persuading the merchants to turn over their entire cache of opium uh, by promising that the British government would reimburse them for their costs, for, for their losses. And so this deal seemed to satisfy everyone. Uh, the Chinese seized this huge drug cache and was able to destroy that uh, illegal contraband. The traders got paid full price anyway, didn't really care. And the flashpoint had been diffused and the port remained open to international trade. So everyone was happy, apart from the British Prime Minister, who's effectively just been landed with this huge bill to buy that enormously valuable, enormous cash of opium, which had been uh, seized and then destroyed. And the Prime Minister felt backed into a political corner. And from his point of view, the only choice he could see open to himself was to force China to reimburse Britain uh, for those destroyed goods. And this basically set uh, in motion what became a common feature of European imperialism, which was gunboat diplomacy. The British sent over a task force of troops and ships um, and started what became known as the First Opium War. Uh, they blockaded the mouth of the Pearl River. They captured a number of ports along the coast. Uh, Chinese armies on land were torn apart by the British rifles and their um, like some military training and, 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 and tactics. And so the Chinese were forced to sue for peace. And in the humiliating Treaty of Nanking, uh, they had to not only pay for the opium that had been destroyed in the first place, pay the British back for the cost of coming over there with their army to sort it all out. Uh, they had to cede Hong Kong, the, the fragrant harbour, uh, to the British as a colony, and open another five treaty ports along the coast, uh, including Shanghai. Uh, the British weren't satisfied with even that and thought, right, we're going to go have another go at this. And the Second Opium War then uh, forced China into fully legalizing opium. It was just an open trade of opium into China after that. Um, so by the time the Jap uh, Japanese invaded China in 1937, an estimated 10% of the entire Chinese population, some 40 million people, were addicted to opium from this forced trade by the British. And it wasn't until 1949 and the communist regime of China and Chairman Mao when it eventually got stamped out. So China endured this opioid crisis for around 150 years, forced upon it by corporate greed, by imperial coercion. And effectively, it's a very, very similar situation to what we're facing today, again with opioids, um, more severely in the US than, than perhaps in Europe. But again, that um, opioid crisis driven by companies such as Purdue uh, Pharmaceuticals for, for corporate greed, for trying to make more profits out of the drug they already produced by increasing the number of conditions it was prescribed for, for increasing the availability of opioid-based um, painkillers. So there's a story again here from something fundamental about our biology, how we seek ways of getting out of our mind with different drugs, things like tea or coffee or opiates, and how that ended up having a profound impact on, on the course of history. Um, the last quick story I wanted to tell you, um, just to wrap up in the last five minutes, is now looking at aspects of our psychology and cognitive biases. So kind of glitches in our mental software, bugs in, in the operating system of our brains, if you like. Um, and I wanted to run a, a quick, quick fire quiz. I wanted to introduce a bit of audience participation. Uh, at the end of the talk to help invigorate it because we haven't had coffee for 45 minutes. Um, so I want you to 
Um, read the questions I'm going to put, put up on the, on the slide. Don't bother shouting out an answer. Sort of answer in your own mind. But try to go with your gut. Try to go with what your immediate reaction is to the question. Don't try to sort of outthink it. Don't try to think, oh, he's trying to catch us out, so I'll go for the opposite one that I think. Be honest to yourself. Um, we're, we're trying to demonstrate these cognitive biases. They affect all of us. I'm not trying to make you seem silly or foolish. Go with your gut reaction and what you think uh, the answer is to each of these three questions. And the first one is, do you think you're more likely to win the Euro Millions lottery jackpot or be killed by a vending machine? Are you more likely to win the lottery or be killed by a vending machine? Uh, decide what you think. The second question, uh, are there more words in the English language that start with the letter K or that have K as the third letter in the word? And again, try not to try out think it, try not to labour too much, Just go with what your gut reaction is telling you. And then thirdly, um, are you more likely to die in a car accident or a plane crash? This probably is a, is a I've saved this one to last because it's probably a bit more obvious where we're going with that. Uh, these are the right answers. More people are killed by vending machines than win the lottery. This may come as a surprise to you. I haven't heard of a single person <laughs> being jumped by a vending machine down a dark alley. But I hear about people winning the lottery all the time. But this is an example of one of these cognitive biases called the availability bias, the availability heuristic. I, I more easily bring to my mind examples of lottery winners than people being killed or injured by vending machines. By the way, this tends to be people uh, either trying to get a free packet of crisps or they've put in their money and it hasn't dispensed or it's got annoyingly got caught on one of the sort of the swirly spiral things. So people rock it to try to release the, the product and end up it toppling on them. Um, the second example is one of um, Daniel Kahneman's examples you might have come across in his book, Thinking Fast and uh, Slow. Um, there are far more words that have K as the third letter than begin with the letter K. They're just much harder for us to think about. It's easier to go with K, kangaroo, kick, whatever, um, and come up with more examples quickly so that availability bias again uh, indicates to you that there are more of them and you're more likely to die in a car accident than a plane crash. Plane crashes. Uh, splashed across the news, lots of people will die at the same time, but you're far more likely to die on average uh, in a car crash. So these are examples of the availability uh, bias or heuristic, which is one example of an entire slew of these cognitive glitches. Another one of them is the confirmation bias, which historically, I argue in the book, Columbus suffered from. He went to his deathbed believing adamantly that he had in fact reached the Orient. He'd reached China and not some strange new place, despite the fact that all of the evidence, all the indications he came across in four separate voyages um, towards the West, um, all told him that he wasn't where he thought he was. He couldn't find any of the spices that he was looking for. He took interpreters with him and they didn't have a clue what language was being spoken by the, the peoples they encountered. No one knew of this great civilization of, of China. No one would ever have heard of the Khan that Marco Polo had talked about. So he simply uh, grabbed, uh, grasped at straws. He, he clung on to any indication that he was right and simply discounted or ignored all the greater amount of, of counter-indicative in evidence, which is this confirmation bias. We cling to our pre-existing belief and simply ignore uh, anything else that would, would force us to re reassess that. Um, 200 years later, it was exactly that same confirmation bias that was behind the dodgy dossier building the argument for weapons of mass destruction that led to the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And just two years later, there was a, a report sent back to the president um, by the committee set up to investigate what had gone so catastrophically wrong. There were no weapons of mass destruction there. They weren't even trying. And um, a very telling quote from that report is that when confronted with evidence that indicated Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction, analysts tended to discount such information. Rather than weighing the evidence independently, analysts accepted information that fit the prevailing theory and rejected information that contradicted it. That's basically a textbook definition of what we mean by this glitch in our, in our psychology. And it's this confirmation bias, as well as other kinds of biases, that are going to affect the future that we can create ourselves as well. Particularly with um, big challenges, big problems that lie further in our future than the sort of decisions we make on an everyday day -to -day basis in our lives, such as climate change. We, we all know the kind of sacrifices we need to be making to our lives in terms of eating less meat, not flying off in an airplane to holiday for a bit of sun, 
uh, not driving around in a gas guzzling car, but maybe cycle or walk or take public transport. The problem is those are all sacrifices to our lifestyle in the short term for benefits or advantages that sort of lie over the horizon. They're sort of slightly more indeterminate. So these cognitive biases affected us through history and they're going to determine to a certain extent how we can create the future for ourselves. Um, those are the three examples that I wanted to, to talk to you about. Uh, there's a side of clickbait here. There are other stories uh, that I found fascinating when I was researching and writing this book, uh, Being Human, uh, such as how a mutation in Queen Victoria's DNA uh, contributes to the Russian Revolution a hundred years later, uh, how tropical diseases on the other side of the world help bring about the union between England and Scotland, uh, how our inability to make a particular chemical, a particular compound called a school bait, absolutely dominated the age of sale for hundreds of years and indirectly led to the rise of the mafia. This is the story of, of vitamin C and, and scurvy. And the surprising outcome is that our solution to vitamin C, growing lots of uh, lime trees out on the island of Sicily, was one of the drivers of the rise of organised crime that, that became the mafia. It's one of these sort of unintended consequences of history. Again, back through that chain of cause and effect to something fundamental about ourselves and our genetics. So thank you ever so much, everyone, for, well, firstly, for coming along. Secondly, for not leaving halfway through. Uh, I hope you found uh, it interesting. I did over-talk uh, by a couple of minutes. Um, I've, he's been giving me the eagle eyes for, from the side there. Uh, but we do still have some time for questions. If anyone has got anything you want to ask about this book, about being human, about how you can reboot civilization after an apocalypse, about how we search for life on other planets, uh, I consider any of that fair game if you want to ask about any of the topics I sort of alluded to uh, through the course of this talk. Um, but thanks again, everyone. Cheers. Uh, hey, Lewis, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so, uh, any, uh, based on your research, right, like, uh, what, what would you say are the reasons for humans wanting to go outside of their brains? Or what, what are, like, even in this world, I think uh, currently we see different forms of humans wanting to go outside of their brains, yeah. like media, right? Uh, in the past, it used to be, op I mean, it's still a case right now as well, but any reasons from a biological perspective or from an anthropological perspective through, due to which humans want to escape their minds all the time? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'll repeat a case in here. It's basically, why might it be that humans enjoy getting out there, changing their minds, getting out of their brains so much? Um, and I wonder if it's a great question, but with almost a dissatisfying answer, be because it's fun, because we enjoy it, because it does trigger that mesolimbic pathway. We do get that buzz of pleasure. There are, of course, um, anthropological um, aspects as well. I didn't really mention uh, the use of hallucinogens, but they are another very important class of psychoactive compounds which have been used by many, many cultures around the world um, to have outer body experiences, to induce visions, to commune with the spirits and, and, and gods, which is you know, a perfectly valid reason to take something like uh, psychocybin uh, mushrooms or um, peyote was another quite commonly used um, hallucinogen in, in the Americas. So there are many different ways that we choose to change how our mind works, to, to basically get out of the sort of drudgery of, of everyday life and have that, let's say, sort of little buzz, little buzz of, of pleasure. Uh, are there like many examples of other species who also find, search for such shortcuts of pleasure or they don't have kind of a time for that? There's an interesting example, but also a pretty unpleasant example that I, I talk about in the book, uh, where you can trigger the mesolimbic pathway by eating, having sex, or by having a cup of tea, or licking on some opium poppies. Um, but you could also, if you wanted the experiment, uh, slide an electrode through your skull, into your brain, and just tickle the mesolimbic pathway with electrical impulses. You can electrically trigger the brain. Uh, we don't do that to people, because you never get ethical approval, uh, but those sort of experiments were done a few decades ago on lab rats. And um, the lab rats had control of that stimulation of the mesolimbic pathway with a button, and they basically just pushed it and 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 they stopped drinking and they stopped eating and they stopped moving away from the button and they just pushed it and they pushed it and they pushed it until they basically keeled over from exhaustion and died. Like this so fundamental to motivating driving our behavior with that system that if you find a way to short circuit and hack it, it's impossible to, to do anything else. And this is why addictions are, cause, uh, are called diseases. Like the, the, the addict who feels compelled to smash a car window to grab a, you know, a wallet they can see on the dashboard or something, is suffering from a disease. They're suffering from addiction 
they're not in control of their actions to avoid those withdrawal effects and, and sort of uh, rebalance the system once they have developed that addiction. Um, so not just the electrode experiments, but um, some of these other psychoactive compounds animals will preferentially choose given the choice as well. So this, this is a very ancient pathway in our brains. Uh, other mammal species have a very similar mesolimbic pathway, um, also uh, mediated by dopamine. And if not dopamine, then very, very similar other compounds, other molecules are used across the animal kingdom. This is basically a universal way that animals invented, animals have evolved to tune their behavior to help their survival, um, to, to learn what is a good thing to do and what to avoid doing. You've written a book about how the earth shaped us and a book about how our biology shaped us. So how, which of those had a more, a large influencing factor on humanity? If that's not too big of a question. No, it, 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 it is a solid question. Um, and I think the first thing to point out is, Origins talked, talked about planetary influences on, on human history. This one is talking about aspects of our biology on human history. And you always want to be careful of not committing sort of geographical determinism or biological determinism. Um, so I can argue, in, as I do in Origins, for example, that a particular band of rocks in the American uh, southern states uh, correlates with voting behaviour. I'm, I'm not saying, of course, that people are compelled to vote in a particular way because the rock's beneath their feet. It's not, it's not deterministic. But you also don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and pretend that there are no influences of geography or where resources are found or aspects of our biology that are important in history. Of course, things like socioeconomic factors or um, you know, so trade factors or political factors are, of course, important. What I'm trying to do with these two books is just widen that perspective a little bit and say, well, let's look at the geographical factors as well. Let's look at the biological factors. And then with uh, knowledge, I was looking at sort of factors to do with our inventions and contingencies in invention and, and technology. Hi, Lewis. Um, is there anything about our biology which directed us to develop what we would call the nuclear family compared to other familial structures? So thinking about another mammal, like elephants obviously have quite successful matriarchal family structures look very different from ours. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on, on that. Yeah, the human family that I described is, is not unique to humans. It, it is something of an anomaly. We are slightly weird in doing it. There are other examples in the animal kingdom. There are other examples of pair bonding animals like a lot of birds, like I talked about, but pair bonding is quite rare within mammals. And the sort of nuclear family, the sort of two parents, two kids, two or three kids, is kind of a... Um, oddity of modern industrialized Western civilization. And many cultures around the world lived in much larger family groups with sort of wider kin, you know, so grandparents living with their, with their children and grandchildren, aunts and uncles playing very important roles in each other's lives. Um, so although I'm not trying to say that that sort of two parents, two or three children, nuclear family um, is sort of biologically determined, what I'm saying is that that bond between the parents and the bond from the parents to the children is biological, it's mediated by that um, oxytocin hormonal bond, which forms the core of these wider networks of, of, of kin and, and relatives and, and relationships. What's one of the stories that you, you had to drop? You, you, the word count is always over. What, what had to go? There are a couple of things um, which I thought was a great story, but I couldn't convince myself was true, or was, which is always frustrating right, when you've got a great story. Um, or, or I couldn't find enough evidence in the literature to sort of back it up. And I think as a science writer, or anyone, you've got to be really careful about allowing something to slip through just because you like it. Uh, so a couple of examples. Um, some of the two middle chapters in the book deal with diseases. So endemic disease and then also pandemic disease and plagues and the effects that they've had on history. And some examples on that which I sort of read about and think, oh, that sounds neat, that kind of makes sense, but is, is, it, is it true? And I had to make the call on some of those and going, look, I, I, I can't put it in. I'll just allude to it in talks when it's not being recorded, right? Um, so my question is, in many of the stories you shared, which are really great, uh, there is the element of, I think, pursuit of power or like a, a addiction to power, such as in the um, Iraq war or the opium war. So do you think it's becoming or it's already part of the, our biology or um, at least for a subset individuals of, of humans? Yeah, again, it's interesting when you try to compare humans to our 
most closely related primate uh, relatives, so this is the bonobos or the chimpanzees, and trying to work out are humans intrinsically warlike, intrinsically aggressive, intrinsically dominant, or intrinsically more egalitarian. It's, it's a complex and, and mudded issue. What does seem to be the case, as I talk about uh, in the first chapter of the book, when I'm talking about the software for civilization, like what, what had to happen in human evolution to enable us to live in large, peaceful societies and therefore develop civilization and, and live in cities in the first place. It seems that there was a clear trend towards decreasing certain kinds of aggression and violence in our evolutionary lineage. But it, it persists. You know, people do still seek dominance. They seek positions of power. They seek ways of amassing resources and therefore wealth and therefore influence. And clearly that became easier with civilization and cities, um, particularly when someone who starts off with some more resources can, can buy muscle. They, they can give some of their grain to someone else to put on some armor and go fight in, in their army for them. It becomes a sort of positive feedback process. Um, that, that sort of social hierarchies and dominance hierarchies are sort of baked in in that sense. A bit of follow-up on that, but is there anything in our biology that gives you hope for the advancement of that egalitarian aspect? So, like, you know, we have this shortcut in the brain. We can, as well, like, just all click the button. Like, we are all already advanced enough to be able to just click the button. Like, what is there to, that gives you hope that we will not end up all just clicking the buttons? Yeah, again, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to claim that we are slaves to our biology. We, we do have huge levels of intelligence, self-awareness. We can make our own decisions. Um, some of the things with cognitive biases I talked about sway those decisions that we make. Sometimes we're not always making the most rational decisions for, for certain definitions of rationality. Um, but there is a huge research effort at the moment within those cognitive biases of how to sort of de-bias ourselves. What is the best way of setting up a committee structure or framing a discussion so that you don't get swayed by whoever speaks first or who happens to be the most eloquent or dominant speaker? How can you um, minimise the effects of those cognitive biases? Although that, that ends up being quite hard because even if you are aware of the existence of a bias, it can still sort of trap you in it. You can still be sort of swayed by it subconsciously. So I'm not saying we're slaves to our biology. Advances are being made. Um, I give, a, give an example in one of the later chapters about the Good Friday Agreement and how that was successful in securing peace um, in Northern Ireland because they successfully got over some of those cognitive biases um, and specifically loss aversion. So there, there are some good examples of, of that being successfully achieved. With that, we will say thank you very much to Lewis Martin. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.